Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you, Farka, very much for uh, the invitation. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to give you a um, presentation on our research. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there uh, in person, um, but um, hopefully one day um, <laughs> I'll be able to make it. So, um, so I chose this very generic uh, topic uh, talk topic for my talk uh, because I'm yes I'm going to cover a few different topics that uh, involve using simulations uh, to study intrinsically disordered proteins. Um, so. Hmm. Um, uh, so, uh, I guess the, <clears throat> one might ask how molecular simulations are useful uh, for studying IDPs. Um, and uh, I guess the main reason is that uh, disordered proteins are uh, highly heterogeneous, uh, I mean, in terms of populating very uh, diverse conformations. And that makes it very challenging to study them by experiment because any observable that you can see is generally uh, averaged over um, all of these conformations, which are rapidly into converting. Um, and so when you can't uniquely pin down a structure as you would be able to do for a folded protein. Um, and then I guess, I mean, the other thing you would hope to be able to do from simulations is maybe predict uh, well, use, use them to predict uh, what uh, the properties of an IDP would be from its sequence and thus what its function might be. Um, and then I guess um, one of the things I'm going to be talking about is how you can use ID, <coughs> use simulations together with uh, the available experimental data to try and form a picture. Um, and then lastly, I guess, is um, one may have um, some theoretical model for how IDPs uh, should behave, which you could then use to make predictions of that experiment, but you would maybe want to test how, um, you know, how, how accurate are the assumptions underlying that theory. Um, also, IDPs can be uh, useful for, um, for simulations, though, because um, they can uh, <laughs> uh, perhaps um, uh, not exactly welcome, but they can reveal shortcomings of, of energy functions um, and, um, and, and also allow you to, uh, to produce more accurate uh, force fields for proteins and protein folding. Um, because unlike folded proteins, which are really relatively insensitive to the force field parameters, um, uh, the the I mean the distribution of conformations you get from a disordered protein is exquisitely sensitive to uh, to the chosen parameters. Um, so uh, just to give a, an outline of my talk, um, I'm going to I guess cover four main topics. Uh, firstly, very briefly, I'm going to talk about kind of older work that we did using uh, IDPs uh, to improve atomistic simulation force fields. Um, mainly just to um, highlight the fact that one can't assume that um, a modern force field that's distributed with um, you know, an MD code is gonna give you a realistic <clears throat> description of IDPs. Uh, and then also to introduce some of the work I'm talking about later in the, the talk. Um, then I'm going to um, uh, talk about um, using uh, simulations together with experiments um, as a uh, tool for interpreting um, experimental data. Um, uh, and then um, uh, I'm going to move on to uh, looking at liquid liquid phase separation of IDPs, developing a coarse grain model for understanding that. And lastly, sort of unpublished work that we've done, uh, trying to map that back to an atomistic simulation to try and get at <clears throat> the details that one can't get from. Uh, uh, from coarse grain models. Okay, so um, I guess there's two main issues that um, kind of exist in many force fields still to this day, uh, which is the first is a secondary structure bias, which was revealed in folding simulations. I'm showing some old simulations that were done in Klaus Schulten's group, um, where uh, they tried to fold this WW domain, and instead they got kind of helical structures. <clears throat> and this could be traced back to the fact that this particular charm 20, 22 CMAP force field uh, 
was uh, had a propensity for forming um, helices, uh, and so it would, uh, and and. So that was one problem. Then the second problem was this issue of um, unfolded states being too collapsed. Um, and uh, so um, in experiments, while well, well, one can measure the radius of gyration of an unfolded protein, um, and actually it's interesting that it, you see that the, uh, that the chain collapses with increasing temperature. That's because the, the hydrophobic effect gets stronger with temperature. Um, uh, in simulations, you can see that qualitatively, some simulations are, uh, <clears throat> some force fields are capturing this, in particular with like more recent water models, like qualitatively capturing this collapse. But if you try and align these two axes, then you'll see that basically the simulation plot is just not even on the same page as the experiment here. So, uh, so the simulation force fields are uh, much too uh, much too collapsed. Um, and that, that was the second problem. So the secondary structure bias uh, issue has been uh, corrected by just basically adjusting torsion angle parameters for the backbone uh, against uh, data for um, peptides, uh, disordered peptides in water. Um, and um, then, uh, this protein collapse problem has been uh, adjusted essentially by modifying the water model, either what we did and what uh, was done by Teresa Head Gordon, where they match, they modify, um, uh, we modify the protein water interactions uh, specifically, or by actually coming up with a whole new water model, which is what uh, the approach that uh, the DE Shaw group and Stefano, Stefano Piana took. Uh, so I just wanted to say something briefly about our optimization strategy. Um, so as I mentioned in our earlier work, we'd found that just changing to TIP 4 p uh, Eervolt, for example, wasn't enough uh, to uh, fix this collapse problem. Um, so uh, we wanted to um, uh, modify, we knew we had to modify something about the protein force field. We didn't want to change the protein protein-protein interactions, um, uh, but because um, in the amber force field, uh, there wasn't any uh, specific optimization against a water model, uh, we felt it was justified uh, to just um, selectively modify the mixing rule uh, that's used between uh, the, the, protein, uh, the protein atoms and the um, uh, and the water acid, water oxygens, which usually uh, usually this uh, gamma is equal to one, and we just uh, allow that to uh, be adjustable. Um, and we used um, data, FRET data from uh, Ben Schuller's group on this shortish fragment of cold shock protein, which we're able to actually uh, simulate relatively easily with the replica exchange simulations. And we found that um, one can match uh, the FRET efficiency uh, pretty well um, just by adjusting uh, this uh, scaling between the protein water interactions. Uh, and what's interesting is that it's extremely sensitive to the value of gamma. I mean, um, so, and we're right in this kind of transition region where uh, the chain is sort of, uh, <clears throat> where the radius of gyration is in fact most sensitive to uh, the value of this parameter. Um, and so this is just to emphasize that it's a relatively small modification. And we've sort of validated this by uh, calculating a small angle X-ray scattering of uh, an IDP. Um, and this is a kind of a, a cheap calculation using Chrysol, but the, uh, the original force field is, is much more collapsed than the uh, than the modified one, and, and similarly, the modified one uh, gives a better agreement with the experiment. And, and since then, a couple, several groups have independently shown um, that this uh, model provides um, uh, uh, a good um, a good a good fit to um, uh, the dimensions of unfolded proteins with SACs. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, Fraka's group is also. Uh, looked at uh, dimensions of unfolded proteins and the, the force field dependence. Um, so, um, so this has, I mean, this is not just um, an arcane um, 
question for people measuring sacs on unfolded proteins, um, but um, the uh, it also has implications for you know what inferences you're going to make from your simulations. For example, um, if one uh, were to use any of these old force fields, um, this is a, a relatively recent paper where they um, Angel Garcia's group performed. Uh, pretty thorough replica exchange simulations on the Alzheimer's A-beta peptide, 40 residue peptide, which, um, and in each of these force fields, they, they get kind of common features coming out, uh, relatively stable um, uh, beta hairpins being formed. Um, <clears throat> and what we found when we applied this uh, modified force field is that actually the uh, peptide is largely um, unstructured, and that, that's consistent with um, NMR data um, from Adbax's group and, uh, and, um, and uh, single molecule FRET data from uh, Hoi Sung Chung's group. Um, so there, there is some sort of so, uh, direct uh, implication um, for, uh, for peptide function from the force field. Um, so the second topic I wanted to talk about uh, was uh, how we can use uh, simulations to try and uh, better interpret experimental data. Uh, so um, I guess the first question is, you know, how does one go about matching experimental data? Uh, because there's many ways you can imagine um, fitting uh, all atom simulations to, to experiments. Um, so if I start out with some distribution of uh, well, some distribution of confirmations, and I have an observable A where I have like some initial um, some initial distribution uh, that I get out of the simulation, and that, that this is the mean in the simulation, this is the mean in the experiment. Um, so one option I could take is I just uh, select all of the uh, confirmations uh, in the simulation where uh, the value of A is equal to the experimental mean. And obviously that's not the right thing to do. We know that we expect that um, there is a distribution of A in, in the underlying ensemble. So we wanna kind of minimally perturb this um, simulation ensemble in order to uh, match experiments. So maybe something like this is more what we wanna do. We wanna just kind of select uh, this peak in the uh, simulation distribution, which happens to match the experiment and uh, sort of neglect this uh, side peak, which is presumably uh, uh, not relevant to uh, the experimental data. So um, the way that we, we one can do this is using an ensemble uh, fitting approach um, where you generate like an initial ensemble of, of structures uh, and then you reweight the ensemble uh, uh, to match the experimental data. So that's relatively straightforward. I mean, you're just um, doing a weighted average of, <clears throat> of the property and you minimize the deviation from experiment. Uh, now, as I kind of just alluded to, there's many ways one could do that. One ideally wants to choose the way that um, has the smallest uh, impact on um, uh, on the on on the original simulation distribution, um, and the way we do this is by um, by applying a kind of regularization uh, where we take the Shannon entropy of the uh, the weights. Um, so the Shannon entropy is um, maximized uh, when uh, when all the weights are equal, um, and so. Uh, if we um, if we basically add so if we have our um, our objective function that we're trying to fit is basically a, originally just a chi squared and then we um, we subtract um, some uh, factor times the uh, uh, times this uh, Shannon entropy then we can um, penalize any uh, any weights which make which are very um, uh, uh, very, uh, let's say, unequal, where all of the weights, let's say, are down to only a few of the uh, confirmations in the simulation. Um, and so I guess the question here is, how do you choose uh, this fitting temperature, if you like? Um, uh, 
And so I guess I can give an example of, of, of <clears throat> where we did this. Um, so the, um, uh, this is an example where we were trying to fit an ensemble of data to both um, freight experiments and sax experiments. Uh, we were trying to resolve uh, an apparent controversy that had existed in the literature about why one experiment was showing collapse and another one wasn't. Um, so we, we found that basically both data sets could be fitted to the same ensemble of, of confirmations. And um, we did this using this ensemble fitting method, but where, um, and I'm just going to illustrate how we uh, chose the, uh, the fitting temperature here. So um, what you find is that if you, um, if you make um, uh, the, the T uh, low, um, then there's a small, <clears throat> there's a small penalty uh, uh, for, um, there's a small penalty for uh, a, a low entropy um, uh, set of weights. Um, so you can always fit the data there because you've got kind of infinite, <clears throat> you've got a lot of choice in, uh, in how you choose the weights. Uh, but then it, as you increase the temperature, uh, this fitting temperature, you of course <clears throat> tend to increase uh, the, uh, the entropy. And uh, at some point you see that the, uh, the actual fit to the data starts to get worse. So that means uh, you reach the point that um, you, can't, um, you can't keep the weights any more uniform without, yeah, without uh, not Kind of fitting the experimental data, um, and this uh, the the result of this um, uh, the result of this fitting, uh, which was to um, a, a bunch of different data sets at different uh, denaturant concentrations, uh, was to show that uh, the uh, distribution of radius of gyration as you increase denaturant concentration. Uh, from you know, zero molar to six molar, the, um, the <clears throat> distribution shifts to larger, larger radius of gyration, which you, which you also see here. Um, so that's just kind of an example there. Uh, this is equivalent actually to um, these uh, uh, restrained ensemble simulations. Uh, this is something that was uh, shown in this paper uh, by um, uh, Benoit Roux and uh, and, um, and and where um, um, that if you if you have <coughs> if you if you uh, run uh, an ensemble simulation with a number of replicas where you're applying a bias to the average uh, observable over all of the re replicas being sim simulated in parallel, this actually is equivalent to what I just showed, except one has to use uh, a very large number of replicas. Um, then um, uh, one can um, one can also do a simpler things. So I guess this is um, this is in the spirit of uh, what I said in the introduction that um, uh, you uh, you can obviously use simulations to interpret experiments like directly, but that requires then that I run a simulation every time that you know, I need to interpret an experiment, which may not be so uh, convenient for experimentalists. So one would wanna have a kind of simpler analytical method that, um, that one can use to interpret experiments, but which will be um, more accurate. Um, and so we came up, for example, uh, in the Fret and Sachs, um, case we came up with an example uh, with with uh, modified uh, methods for uh, for interpreting um, uh, fret data and uh, and sax data which are similar to the ones people already use but just um, uh, slightly modified to to avoid um, the inaccuracies um, so for example uh, for fret data um, people usually interpret the signal by uh, so you have an, an average fret efficiency, which is just um, uh, just the average over some distribution of um, of <clears throat> of distances between the chromophores and the uh, 
the threat as a function of distance. And usually then one, one optimizes some parameters in this distance distribution in order to match the experimental efficiency. That's how the experiments are, are interpreted. Um, uh, but the problem is that um, the results very much depend on what kind of uh, form you choose for this end-to-end uh, -end distance distribution. Um, so uh, here, what we did was we tried, so what you find is that uh, for um, kind of more uh, expanded IDPs, uh, for example, in high denaturant or highly charged IDPs, um, you find that a self-avoiding walk uh, works pretty well as your P of R, but then if you're in like water, for example, uh, then often a Gaussian chain RDP, uh, um, <coughs> P of R works better um, for, uh, for fitting the distri distribution. Um, so one can, um, uh, one can use a, um, a kind of interpolation method to uh, uh, bridge between these two scenarios. And, and this is this uh, saw new method that uh, was devised by my former postdoc, Wenwei Zheng, um, where uh, we, we actually just take the standard distribution for a self-avoiding walk, which actually only has one adjustable parameter, which is the, uh, the end, average end-to-end -end distance. And we, um, uh, we, we treat the uh, scaling exponent, which is supposed to be uh, the one for self-avoiding walk as an adjustable parameter. So that gives us now uh, two adjustable parameters, uh, which is too many to fit uh, standard um, uh, fret efficiency, which is only one variable. So we kind of introduced this closure uh, relation um, based on the expected scaling uh, for the end-to-end -end distance of a, um, of a protein, uh, where I guess the key thing is we're assuming a particular value for this uh, prefactor B. And, um, and, and doing that, we find that we can uh, really recover uh, the, if we fit the transfer efficiency generated from a simulation, from simulation ensemble as a function of temperature, for example, uh, then we can recover very well with this uh, saw new model, uh, the true end-to-end -end dis distance, that, and as well as the distribution. Um, where, while what you find is, for example, the Gaussian chain is uh, uh, really overestimated um, at certain under certain conditions, and the uh, uh, the conventional excluded uh, self-avoiding walk model is. Uh, uh, um, is underestimating it under other conditions. So, okay. Um, so that's uh, um, that's the, as far as um, uh, reweighting and um, so on goes. Uh, now, I, I I so I mentioned already how one can reweight existing simulations. Now, another, another approach one can take if you uh, want to interpret experimental data. Um, uh, from simulation uh, is to use a kind of bottom uh, bottom up model where you're just actually adjusting the let's say force field parameters of the simulation directly to match um, the uh, experiment. Um, I mean, doing so requires a much simpler model. Um, but I'm going to give an example of where uh, we were able to do that for this um, model of uh, prothymosin alpha. Um, and histone H1. Um, and uh, so uh, this is a collaboration with, uh, with Ben Schuller's group um, where, um, uh, so I guess I should introduce first of all, actually what, <laughs> what H1 is. I think many of you will be familiar with that, but uh, so you have the uh, you have <coughs> DNA uh, is wrapped around um, uh, these nucleosomes, what's um, it's wrapped around these histones rather to form nucleosomes, and um, you uh, at this um, at the uh, in this linker region you have uh, the so-called linker histone, uh, which is or histone H1, uh, which 
which binds there and um, so what's usually uh, shown I guess in the structure is they have this ordered part of H1 that they can see but then actually most of the protein is, is disordered um, so what I'm going to be talking about is the interaction of H1 with this uh, protein uh, prothymus and alpha uh, which uh, is a highly uh, negatively charged IDP that is able to well believed to act as a chaperone that can help to strip H1 from nucleosomes. Um, so um, that's the introduction. And um, to get some, intro, uh, so this is just, this is the folded part of H1. So as you can see, it's like the, the smallest part of the chain. Um, so uh, Ben's group, um, did FRET experiments, um, I'm sorry for the resolution of these figures, uh, but so these are correlation functions, um, so FRET correlation functions between, uh, for example, the donor and acceptor, which are anti-correlated and the donor, donor and acceptor, acceptor, which are positively correlated with each other as a function of, of time. So this, <clears throat> the decay of these correlation functions gives information on the, uh, the dynamics of the um, of the of the chain between the chromophores. The, here they've labeled the prothymosin, but it's in uh, in the context of a complex with H1. And what you see is that um, uh, regardless of, of how they do the labeling, you see dynamic switches on the sort of order of 100 nanoseconds. Uh, which is very similar to the time scale that they get for the free protein without uh, being uh, in complex with, with the other one. Um, so uh, that suggests a highly dynamic complex, obviously likely to be disordered. Um, and they also had uh, detailed FRET data for uh, labeling at several sites, um, uh, which I'm so this is a kind of combination of three sites on the prothymosin and um, um, multiple sites on the H1, and they've measured uh, intermolecular FRET uh, as, um, as a function of labeling position for all of these combinations. Uh, so, uh, so there's clearly like some uh, information here on which, uh, which regions are uh, most tightly bound in the complex, but obviously difficult to interpret because of the disorder. Um, and so this is why they turned uh, to, uh, to us to do uh, simulations. Uh, in this case, we chose not to use mystic simulations, although we, we, um, we have started doing something on that, as I'll say in a minute. But um, uh, the problem is that these proteins are you know, hundreds of residues long and, um, and you know, have um, multivalent interactions that is, is difficult to average over. So we decided to go initially with a, um, with a very coarse grain model where we represent uh, each um, residue as just a single bead. So really simple. Uh, and we have a bunch of um, fairly standard bonded terms. Um, uh, we have a screened electrostatic term um, and then we have a term in green, which is uh, described, which is basically just a Go model to keep the globular domain of the uh, H1 folded. So <clears throat> the term I actually wanted to talk about is the, uh, uh, the this protein-protein uh, interaction term, uh, which is described by like a 12-6 uh, potential. Um, and um, so you, uh, um, uh, so so we we treat we we started out with a kind of a more complicated model, but in the end we actually reduced it to, to describing all residues uh, with the same uh, interaction energy, uh, so that the only thing that distinguishes the residues in the chain is the um, is the charges and this uh, this electrostatic term. So there was only one free parameter in the model in the end, which was this um, epsilon for the protein-protein interactions. Um, and by just adjusting that single parameter, we were able to match uh, all of the transfer efficiencies that were uh, experimentally measured for all of these combinations of labeling positions. Um, 
Uh, and what we uh, what we also predict is a much lower affinity for a second uh, molecule binding. Uh, for example, um, adding a second prothymus in alpha or a second H1 to, to an existing complex is a much uh, lower, <coughs> is a much um, smaller um, energetic reward for that. And that explained why you see just a one-to-one -one complex of these two proteins at the single molecule concentration. Um, um, of course, um, if you go to higher concentrations, you do see higher order oligomers being formed, um, uh, but I'm not going to describe that today. So, um, and <clears throat> so we were also able to uh, uh, compare the contacts formed in the complex, which I'm plotting here. From this, so this is from simulation uh, with uh, observables from NMR, such as the um, the signal intensity. So this kind of broadening that you see over here in the uh, prothymosin uh, signals is associated with the region that's forming the most contacts with the H1, uh, which is also actually the most uh, charged region of the protein. Uh, so what do these complexes look like? Uh, this was kind of difficult to really uh, uh, summarize. Um, so, I mean, I guess I can uh, start by just showing a, a contact map which shows um, uh, that, I mean, there are uh, contacts formed um, kind of almost everywhere between the H1 and the, and the prothymosin, although they tend to be uh, concentrated, uh, they tend to be concentrated towards uh, the C terminus of the prothymosin, which is, the most charged H1, the charge is more uniformly distributed. And so uh, the uh, contacts are um, more, <clears throat> more uniformly distributed along its length. Um, and I, to try and visualize this is kind of difficult because these uh, are really very diverse uh, conformations, but I plotted it along some kind of principal components which are derived from the contact map. And one can see kind of I don't know, <laughs> a lot of uh, a lot of very diverse uh, structures being populated. Um, uh, we have since moved uh, towards looking at uh, all atom simulations, um, and I'm showing here some um, uh, some simulations of just the globular domain uh, together with um, with H1. Uh, so with with prothymosin, I have to emphasize actually the globular domain is the the least important part of uh, H1 for the binding, but uh, it's nonetheless, we started with this to be some, have something tractable for simulations and you can sort of see the, um, the prothymosin um, um, dancing around the H1 and even dissociates at some point. Uh, and then it's um, again, interacting um, and so as you can see there's, yeah. <laughs> There isn't like one defined interaction mode. It's really a very, um, uh, very heterogeneous. Um, and this, on the right here, I'm just showing uh, NMR relaxation data, um, uh, which uh, we've. So the simulation is is in yellow, and then the, the blue is the measured. So uh, it seems to be really in in pretty good agreement, suggesting that this uh, uh, that the dynamics that we're observing here is. Uh, is, is realistic. Um, okay, then as a, as a second example of um, the uh, this disordered, um, of describing disordered complex, I'm just going to quickly describe uh, another collaboration with Ben Schuler where we looked at the uh, this disordered chaperone, um, which is actually a part of a, a viral um, coat protein that um, helps uh, nucleic acids to fold, in this case, looking at a DNA hairpin. Um, and so similar to the, the previous case with prothymus and H1, uh, we uh, used uh, the same model basically for the protein. And for the, uh, for the DNA, we had a three site model um, where we uh, adjusted um, uh, the interactions uh, between uh, the protein and um, so, so we adjusted the, the stacking interactions with the uh, 
uh, the DNA to get the sing to get the efficiencies of the DNA correct by itself. And then when you add the protein, we just adjusted the interactions between the, the two molecules. Um, and you can see again that we can match both this uh, intramolecular fret as well as the, uh, the intermolecular fret pretty well uh, using this kind of an approach. Um, so this gives us a kind of a, a kind of a basic model for, for a protein DNA interactions that are driven by charge. Obviously, um, there are other important interactions with DNA that are not maybe captured so well by this model. Um, so, um, so this is just showing uh, that you can see uh, uh, if you um, if you have the this NCD by itself, uh, it stays. Um, uh, you're seeing uh, mostly, I guess, donor photons, and then. Um, uh, and then when you add uh, the uh, when you add the chaperone, you can see that it uh, the folded state becomes much more uh, populated. Um, and the same thing happens here uh, when you uh, when you have um, uh, when you look at it in the simulation. Um, so the, all the evidence we have seems to suggest that, the way that the um, that the chaperone works is effectively by mimicking a very high salt concentration, but without having to have such a high salt. Um, so, if you compare, um, uh, for example, the uh, the folding rate that you get uh, with just adding the chaperone, it's comparable to uh, kind of molar concentrations of salt. Um, and actually, in the simulations, this is um, we, we see that we can entirely explain the effect of the, um, the chaperone uh, by, in, in terms of its uh, ability to collapse uh, the DNA. So here I'm showing the, um, the radius of gyration uh, for uh, the DNA um, with, uh, um, I'm, sh I'm showing the RG for the DNA uh, with no chaperone present here. And then over here, I'm showing it uh, with the chaperone present. So you can see it stabilizes the collapsed uh, and <clears throat> also the folded state. Um, uh, and if all, if all we do is we uh, um, apply the, the difference between these two uh, potentials to the radius of gyration, then we can uh, pretty much reproduce the uh, the folding kinetics, uh, the change in folding kinetics that's seen um, in uh, by by adding the chaperone, just by by adding uh, an external potential to collapse the uh, um, to collapse the DNA. Um, so I've spoken, I guess, a bit about a couple of examples where we used uh, coarse grain models to interpret simulations, where we actually just fitted the um, coarse grain model parameters directly uh, to match the experimental data. So I just wanted to, so that sort of made us uh, um, think of developing a more general coarse grain model uh, that rather than just using kind of a single parameter uh, that has a more sequence dependent form to describe IDP interactions. And the reason for this was of course, to look at um, phase separation of IDPs, um, which I'll describe in a minute. So we, we used a model uh, that is very similar to what I just described um, for the um, prothymus and H1 and for the uh, DNA and chaperone um, situations, um, except that we uh, make the, um, the contact potential part, the Lennon Jones part, if you like, um, we make that dependent on the sequence uh, we used one, one model that we used, I'm just showing the, the contact matrix was this uh, so-called Kim uh, Homer model, uh, which is uh, developed uh, a while ago by uh, Gerard Homer for, and uh, Yang Chan Kim for uh, describing folded protein interactions. Um, and uh, this is just showing the different uh, interactions that you get with uh, different strengths of the potential. Um, so we calibrated this against um, radius of gyration of, um, of single protein chains. Uh, the reason we did this is because uh, 
uh, as I'll describe in a minute, there's uh, expected to be a correlation between uh, the single chain uh, RG and the uh, um, uh, and the uh, phase transition or the critical temperature for um, uh, for uh, phase separation. Um, so um, what I'm showing here is uh, you know sort of the optimized uh, single chain RG compared with experiment. Um, and um, well, as you can see, the agreement isn't exactly perfect, but we've actually since uh, refined this model and we should be, uh, uh, we're just <laughs> wrapping up that paper at the moment for, uh, for publication. Um, and so we'll be able to get, get that much better since, but um, as a kind of uh, first generation, this was a kind of reasonable way of looking at uh, phase separation. Now, I probably don't need to give a lot of introduction to uh, the membraneless organelles, uh, which are uh, regions of uh, high protein and other comp or high concentration of uh, high, high, high concentration of proteins and other biomolecules, in particular nucleic acids in cells. Um, there's a whole variety of these, including uh, stress granules and and so on. Um, so this is kind of a pretty uh, hot area at the moment. Um, now, um, it's not always the case that, uh, that this is, it, well, it's certainly not driven only by intrinsically disordered regions, but it's very clear that the proteins that are involved in this uh, generally have large intrinsically disordered regions and very often those intrinsically disordered regions if they're cut out, are able to phase separate in vitro. Uh, so it seems that these are uh, drivers, if you like, for phase separation. So we would like to see if we can kind of uh, predict the properties of these from a coarse grain model. So, um, so to simulate, uh, simulate this, we use this kind of uh, slab approach, which we borrowed uh, from uh, the polymer uh, literature, uh, where you basically just simulate explicitly um, these coarse grain chains at a residue, one residue, one bead per residue level resolution. Um, and we have a very uh, elongated simulation box. Um, now, as you vary, as you, as you cool, as you cool that, <laughs> as you reduce the temperature, uh, you find um, that the, uh, that these chains, which are initially um, in a kind of uniform uh, phase, uh, separate out into a dense phase and, and a dilute phase, uh, stabilized by, um, by energy and, uh, and entropy, respectively. Um, and one can just read off the, uh, the phase diagram uh, by uh, getting the, uh, the, the dense the protein concentration in each of these phases. Um, so we've, uh, we have, in collaboration with uh, Jetain Metal, uh, we uh, compared, um, uh, we did some uh, simple tests of the effect of uh, phosphomimetic mutations on the uh, phase diagram. So going from a wild type fuse, um, no, fused in sarcoma, uh, which is this um, RNA binding protein found in RNP granules. Um, we uh, just looked at what's the, uh, what's the effect of these, um, uh, of, of introducing glutamates to mimic phosphorylation and qualitatively uh, they reduce, um, they reduce the tens tendency to phase separate. So uh, lowering the uh, temperature that you require in our simulations to get uh, phase separation to occur. And that corresponds to uh, a reduction in uh, phase separation in vitro. So these, uh, this wild type forms these puncta, which are indications of high concentrations of protein localized. Uh, whereas this 12E mutant is basically completely distributed throughout the cell, which is uh, clearly not phase separating. I'm gonna skip over this. Um, um, so, um, one can also uh, uh, 
borrow some uh, ideas from polymer physics. Uh, so for uh, homopolymers, at least, it's true that um, uh, that the radius of gyration, uh, uh, well, that the sort of collapsed temperature. So as you um, as you if you start at high temperature. You uh, reduce the temperature, you go through um, a collapse transition to kind of a globular state. And this uh, midpoint temperature is, is known as the theta temperature, where effectively the interactions with, with, within the protein and the protein with the solvent are, are perfectly balanced. Um, it turns out that this corresponds with the uh, uh, critical temperature uh, for uh, for phase separation, which is this uh, um, maximum uh, temperature on this uh, um, phase diagram here. So, um, so could could we use this to relate the properties of uh, um, to relate these uh, phase separation properties to single chain properties, which are obviously much easier to obtain by by simulation and sometimes by experiment as well. Um, and so the answer, I mean, so what we did was we, we, we simulated um, a large number of proteins. Um, so actually it's, um, some of them are the same simulations I showed before for FUSE and LAF1 and some other, uh, uh, some other variants. And what one sees is this uh, collapse temperature, um, oh, sorry, this critical temperature for uh, for uh, phase separation is actually very well correlated with the uh, uh, the collapse temperature or theta temperature of a single chain. Um, this isn't necessarily going to be the case. Remember, that's only true for homopolymer models. But empirically, here it seems that it's a pretty good approximation for these sequences that we've studied. Um, uh, and we found a similar uh, correlation with the uh, the boil temperature, which is the uh, the temperature at which um, the uh, the interactions uh, between well at which the second variable coefficient goes to zero. Um, so I'm going to skip over that. Um, so was, um, yeah, I think I need to move on. So. Um, so, I mean, one can one can derive these kind of uh, generally useful um, uh, uh, pictures of, of phase separation from coarse grain models. And of course, we're trying to make the potentials more accurate so that we can actually capture sequence specific effects uh, much better with a coarse grain model now. Um, but obviously, if you have one site per residue, there's a limited amount of information that you can really uh, get out. I mean, for example, one can't, um, uh, one can't, um, uh, one can't look at which side chains are interacting, or or whether it's a side chain or the backbone. You can't get out information about interactions with co-solutes and salts and so on. So, atomistic simulations would be great, but of course they're very difficult to equilibrate. I mean, if you were to throw a bunch of um, even in one of these like um, homotypic phase separations that we've been studying, talking about so far, um, if you threw a bunch of proteins chains into uh, into a simulation box with explicit solvents, I mean, you would never have any hope of converging um, the formation of a of a uh, condensed phase in a, in a realistic time frame. Uh, so to do this, we uh, we took a uh, kind of multi-scale strategy where we first uh, built uh, an equilibrated uh, coarse grain configuration and then used that to sort of back map to an all atom model and, um, and simulate the dynamics at atomistic resolution. So this is the basic picture. We have uh, our coarse grain model, uh, which is derived from the same coarse grained potential that I, I mentioned uh, in the previous few slides. Um, and then we reconstruct the all atom coordinates um, using a, uh, um, a program from Jeff Skolnick's group, uh, which uh, uses essentially a lookup table from the PDB database uh, to reconstruct all atom coordinates from C alpha coordinates. It actually does a remarkably good job of this, I have to say. Um, 
And um, so this works for like an individual chain, but then one then has to reassemble these reconstructed individual chains uh, together. And uh, when that when you do that, you get a few side chain clashes. So we we, res we resolve those by running a, a short uh, Monte Carlo simulation with uh, uh, the Campari code and uh, absinthe uh, model from Papu's group. Um, and the Campari is of course by Andreas Vitalis. Um, and, and then that gives us uh, some kind of plausible initial condition that we can use uh, to set up in our all atom simulations. Um, so that's, uh, that's good. Um, so one thing I have to mention here is that there's, there isn't, um, uh, I mean, a possible criticism of this is that we didn't systematically coarse grain this model based on uh, the all atom model. Um, and that's true, but at the same time, I guess each, each of these two models has been optimized against experimental data. Um, so uh, we expect that they should both give uh, realistic uh, kind of free energy, uh, well, realistic free energies for protein-protein interactions in, in solvent. Um, and you know, to the extent that the match between the coarse-grained and all-atom models isn't ideal, it could actually be an advantage because it it helps us to to see where whether the atomistic simulation is is properly equilibrated or not. Um, so, um, so the first thing we looked at is just you know how the ions are distributed. This is kind of all uh, unpublished uh, work. Um, so far, um, these were simulations that we ran on the Anton supercomputer with an allocation that we got a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, so we ran a few microseconds of, of simulation with this uh, uh, large simulation uh, setup. Um, and uh, I guess, sorry, there were a few things I wanted to mention here. I mean, the one is, um, this, this box here for the coarse grain simulation is of course like much longer in this uh, Z dimension uh, than I've shown here. I've just taken out this kind of central region where the dense phase is present. Um, and that's because we're only gonna focus on simulating this dense phase in the atomistic simulation for, for the simple reason that we don't really have any hope of studying an equilibrium between the dense and dilute phases in atomistic simulation. That would just take way too long. So all we're really trying to do is look at the properties of this dense phase, and um, uh, because we believe that we can we can equilibrate, let's say, um, uh, the density of this phase, but we're not going to be able to see association of monomers or dissociation, which would be needed to. To, to study the sort of phase equilibrium. So, um, yeah, so we, well, the first thing we found was perhaps not so interesting that we, that, you know, ions, uh, ions are kind of, uh, are kind of preferentially uh, associated with, uh, or, or not associated with the, uh, so you can see in fuse, uh, there's actually a reduced ion density in the slab um, and that's largely, in, in the case, you can explain this pretty much entirely from the fact that there's less, that the protein occupies some of the volume. Um, so if you, um, if you just look at each uh, Z slice, um, the first thing is um, you, you can explain that the sodium and chloride concentrations by just assuming that the charge, well, the charge should be neutral at each Z position and that the, um, uh, that the sodium that there's, and also that there's no preferential interaction of the uh, sodium and chloride ions with the protein. In other words, uh, their concentration scales exactly as the concentration of water around the protein. Um, that makes sense. Um, and similarly, so you see this, the same thing with this left one. So fuse is, fuse is not really charged. So you, um, you don't see um, any, so, so that's why the ions tend to be outside the protein. Um, left one, as you can see, has a net positive charge. And as a result, you've got a slight increase of chloride ions in, in the slab. But again, uh, 
there's no uh, preferential interaction of the salt with the protein charge neutrality is a sufficient explanation uh, for what we see. Um, uh, chain dynamics we see uh, it, within the slab is actually remarkably fast. So just looking at intramolecular uh, correlation functions, uh, you can see that they decay on a sort of hundreds of nanoseconds time scale, which is similar to, I think I showed with the prothymosin, the typical correlation times you see in a, um, <clears throat> in for proteins in a dilute uh, um, scenario. So actually the proteins within the, the dense phase are still relatively dynamic, but their translational diffusion is pretty slow. Uh, as we can see by computing translational diffusion coefficients, um, I think this is like um, 40 times slower than bulk. Um, and these agree pretty well with the, uh, the diffusion coefficients measured from experiments, which I'm showing two values for here. Um, uh, one thing I should point out is that, um, yeah, so this is dependent a little bit on the, the lag time that you use. Uh, we are fitting a, um, we're fitting the distribution of uh, mean square displacements to uh, the diffuse, to a one dimensional diffusive propagator. And that actually fits pretty well, um, but you need to go out to sort of hundreds of nanosecond time scale before uh, this uh, converges. Um, um, so lastly, interactions <coughs> driving phase separation um, so we find that, um, well, I'll just show uh, quickly here since I'm kind of getting sort of <clears throat> towards the end of my time, I think. Um, the, um, yeah. sorry. Uh, just go ahead, but yeah, it would be, I guess it would be time good to, to wrap over. up. Yes, <laughs> uh, I'm almost done. <laughs> uh, so I think this is my, my last slide maybe, yeah. So. Um, yeah, so I think the, I mean, obviously the thing one can do with atomistic simulations is looking at uh, the types of interactions we see in more detail. So I think the executive summary of the slide is that uh, tyrosine is very important. So I'm showing here just the, um, the intermolecular interactions uh, between fuse and itself and left one and itself in these uh, phase separated um, uh, in the high in this uh, in the high density phase, and um, you can see that the coral, the um, highest contacts are associated with tyrosines, which are indicated by these dotted lines, and uh, these are kind of unnormalized um, histograms uh, of the number of interactions between different residue types, uh, kind of compiled from this data. Um, and that's kind of misleading to look at because it just uh, shows you what are the most common residues. But if you, uh, if you normalize by the mean field uh, expectations, so just like the, 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 the frequencies of the different residues in the, um, in the condensed, in, in, in the chain, then you see that really uh, tyrosine, tyrosine interactions really pop up for both proteins as being really important. Um, and for the, um, the left one, which has more charged residues, you see also some interactions between uh, aspartate and glutamate, for example, uh, being uh, particularly uh, uh, important there. In other words, like more commonly observed than you would expect from uh, just mean field uh, expectations. Um, and this is looking a little more closely at the type of interactions. You can kind of drill down into uh, how each residue is interacting, whether it's backbone, backbone, or side chains. And uh, well, it seems like, I guess, the, uh, the bottom line is for, uh, for the tyrosine, for example, um, that uh, it's really um, the side chains are interacting a lot of the time in this, uh, uh, this stacked conformation, but they're also able to form hydrogen bonds with each other, uh, for example. Um, so this is, I guess, the brief summary um, of the various things that I uh, discussed here. Um, and um, I guess uh, um, simulations, <laughs> the bottom line is simulations can be very useful uh, as a tool for interpreting experiments, but also sort of to predict um, 
uh, you know, predict uh, properties of uh, of IDPs and and phase separation. So I just wanted to thank uh, the people who've been most involved. So uh, Wanwei Zheng, who's a, a former postdoc of mine, actually, who did was probably involved in all of these projects somewhere. Um, and um, also my uh, collaborators um, uh, for the uh, for the uh, I mean Ben Schuler's group I think was involved in in several of these collaborations. I mean, firstly the um, uh, the Prothymus and H one and the um, and and the uh, uh, HVNCD uh, chaperone interacting with with DNA um, and um, and then uh, 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 Jitain uh, Mittal, who has been my uh, main collaborator on this uh, simulation work on, on phase separation. Um, so um, thank you. And sorry if I went a, a little over, but um, yeah, <laughs> I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>